Hey everyone, it's Michelle, your CSC Biology Tutor, and in this video, I will be sharing with you 15 diagrams that you need to know in preparation for your biology exams, and we will be focusing on those diagrams found in the section Life Processes on the syllabus, and this would include structures and functions in the human body mostly, and also in plants. So let's get started. So the first topic I'm going to look at will be cells. So we're going to examine the cell structure and focus on the differences and similarities between the plant cell and the animal cell. So these are the two main cells you should know how to label. So let's get going. So A is the cell membrane. And you can see based on the arrows that the, the label line, sorry, you can see that the ones that are pointed at both represent the organelles that are present in both cells. So the cell membrane is present in both the plant and the animal cell. B is the cell wall. So you only find a cell wall in the plant cell. C is the cytoplasm. D is the vacuole. And you can clearly see that the vacuole is much larger in the plant cell compared to the animal cell. The plant cell's vacuole needs to be larger to store more water because plants are not able to get up and move and search for water. So they need to have that storage of water inside of them. E is the nucleus, so the control center in the cell where you have all the genetic material. F is the chloroplast. We're going to look at the structure of the chloroplast shortly. And then G is the mitochondrion. So singular mitochondrion, plural mitochondria. So let's quickly recap. Cell membrane, this provides the barrier for the cells, controls what enters and leaves the cells. The cell wall, offers structure and shape and support to the plant cell. So you're only going to find that in the plant cell. The cytoplasm, this is the jelly-like fluid that would be making up most of the, the cell, the inside of the cell, and where all the other organelles would be pretty much embedded in. The vacuole stores mostly water, sugars, nucleus, that's where you have the genetic information in the form of chromosomes. Then we have the chloroplast, the site of photosynthesis and the mitochondrion, the site of respiration. So you should be able to identify the difference between the mitochondrion and the chloroplast. It is important in terms of labeling so you don't get mixed up between the two of them. So here we have first of all the mitochondrion and it's easily recognized by the inner folds in the structure. Now the chloroplast on the other hand you would see these special membranes stacked up. So that would help you to identify the chloroplast. So this is the difference between the mitochondrion and the chloroplast. Okay, let's move on to the topic of human nutrition. So you need to know how to label a tooth. So let's begin. A is the crown. This is the part of the tooth that is seen and above the gum. B is the root, so the part of the tooth that is embedded into the gum that you cannot see. C is pointing at the enamel, so the hard outer surface of the tooth. D is pointing at the dentine, so that is a little softer layer just underneath the enamel. And E is the pulp often known as the pulp cavity. So this is where you're going to find the blood vessels and the nerves and when your tooth undergoes decay and it starts to break down and reach the pulp, that is when you're going to feel the pain that comes from the toothache because of the nerves. The nerves are sensitive to cold, um, heat. So when you get a toothache, it is because of those nerves in the pulp cavity. And the last one, F, is the gum. So that is the structure of the tooth. 
All right, let's go on to the next diagram. We have the digestive system. So it is pointing at the mouth. So you're gonna have the teeth and the tongue and the saliva to help with mechanical digestion, chemical digestion. B is the esophagus. Sometimes you may see the esophagus just spelled with the E, without the O at the front. So the esophagus is the tube that is going to lead down to the stomach, which is E. So you're going to have further digestion in the stomach. Now going back to C, we have the gallbladder. D is pointing at the liver. So the liver produces a substance called bile which is necessary to emulsify fats and help with the breakdown of the fats, the digestion of the fats. And the gallbladder is what will be storing that bile until it's ready to be released into the pancreatic duct into the small intestines. So let's go, F is the pancreas. So the pancreas actually has two functions. It has a digestive function in terms of producing many enzymes in pancreatic juice. So that pancreatic juice will be secreted into the small intestine. So G is the small intestine. And the pancreatic juice is responsible for carrying different enzymes that will break down starch, fats, and proteins. So that is the digestive function of the pancreas. The part H is pointing at the colon. So the colon is also known as the large intestine and that is responsible for absorbing water and forming the stool, which is the feces. So this is basically going to be carrying the undigested material so any material, any food that has not been broken down by enzymes will be transported in the colon, become more solid, and then it's going to be released out the end. So here we're pointing at the, eye is pointing at the rectum, which is leading out into the anus. All right, so those are the key parts that you need to know how to label in the digestive system. So let's move on to look at some plant structures. So you need to know how to label the external structures of a dicotyledonous leaf. So this is only going to apply to those studying CSET biology. So let's look at the parts of this dicotyledonous leaf necessary for photosynthesis. So A is pointing at the lamina, so the large surface area, nice and thin and flat so that sun can penetrate easily. B is pointing at the apex, so just the point of the leaf. C is pointing at the veins, so the veins carry the vascular bundle, which include your phloem and the xylem vessels, so the veins are responsible for transporting materials throughout the leaf. And it also adds structure and support to the actual leaf. Similarly, D, the midrib, so think of the midrib as a large vein and it's going to offer support as well as carrying materials throughout the leaf. So that midrib is really to help um, support that leaf and pre prevent it from easily tearing. So it's found in the middle of the leaf. And E, E is pointing at the Petiole, so this is the point of the leaf where it's going to be attached to the stem. All right, so we are finished with the external structures of the leaf. So let's look inside the leaf. So what layers you expect to see inside of the leaf are shown here. So you need to be able to label these different layers. So layer A is pointing at the upper epidermis. So this is how you would visualize the leaf if you were looking at it under a microscope. So you can see the different layers of cells. B is the palisade layer. So that contains 
the palisade cells which are usually box shaped and where you would find the majority of photosynthesis actually taking place so you would expect a lot of chloroplasts in that palisade layer C is the spongy layer so these cells are a little more irregular shape rounded and they also carry out photosynthesis as well and they're more loosely packed to allow air spaces for gaseous exchange so these two middle layers the palisade and the spongy layer combined are known as the mesophyll layer so right underneath the mesophyll layer you're gonna have the lower epidermis And remember the epidermis contains cells which generally would not be participating in photosynthesis so the epidermis layer is usually fairly transparent just a low sunlight to penetrate so what you will see on both epidermis layers both the upper and the lower epidermis layers so that is E and G that represents the waxy cuticle So this is going to help conserve water, prevent water loss, excess water loss in the leaf. So the waxy cuticle you would find on both epidermis layers. And usually the waxy cuticle is actually thicker on the upper epidermis because it is more exposed to the sunlight, so therefore more likely to dry out. So that is why you will tend to have more waxy cuticle on the upper epidermis. And then F is just simply pointing at air space between the cells of the spongy layer. So as I mentioned before, this is important in gaseous exchange and diffusion of the gases amongst the cells within the leaf. And what you will see here, the exchange of gases, obviously we're talking about carbon dioxide and oxygen. So we know that plants need carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and they usually produce oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis and those gases would be entering the stoma which is a singular form of stomata plural so stomata these are the small openings in the epidermis layers of the leaf all right so that is it for the dicotyledonous leaf so let's move on to the topic of respiration and we're going to label this respiratory system so first of all we have the nose or the nostrils where the air would enter and leave we have the mouth and it's better to breathe through your nose than your mouth because the nose has little hairs that would help to filter the air prevent any bacteria and dust from getting down into your respiratory system so part three is pointing at the larynx your voice box where you're going to have the vocal cords four is pointing at the right lung five is pointing at the bronchus the right bronchus So going back up let's go back up to seven and eight so seven is actually pointing at your throat the biological term for that is the pharynx eight is pointing at the trachea also known as your windpipe so this is where the air would be flowing downwards towards the lung so then you see from the trachea you have the branches the right and the left bronchi so nine is actually pointing at the left bronchi bronchus one bronchus two bronchi and ten will be pointing at the bronchiole so this is further branching from the bronchi and eleven 
that is the alveoli, the site of gaseous exchange. So it looks like a bunch of grapes. And then finally, sits is pointing at the diaphragm. So that muscular sheet underneath the lungs. So that is it for the respiratory system. So now we're going to continue with respiratory system, but we're going to zone in a little more on the topic gaseous exchange, which occurs at the alveolus. So this is one alveolus shown here, and we know there are many alveoli in the lungs. So you need to know how to label the alveolus. So let's look at these labels. So P is pointing at the capillary. So you always have a capillary wrapped around an alveolus. It acts as the transport system to carry the gases to and fro. So within the capillary, we have red blood cells. So that is what Q is pointing at. And the red blood cells are responsible for transporting oxygen and also carbon dioxide. But we know that red blood cells are mainly responsible for carrying all that oxygen around the body. R is pointing at the lining of moisture that you would find inside of the alveolus. So it's important to have moisture lining the alveolus because that makes it easier for the, the gases to diffuse across the surfaces. So to diffuse across the capillary and then the alveolus. And then S is pointing at the alveolar membrane or wall. So you would notice that the alveolar membrane and the capillary walls, they have to be very thin. So these, these structures, um, it connect back with gases exchange surfaces having to be very thin to make it easy for the gases to diffuse across. So those are the parts that are labeled. And then we have A and B representing the movement of gases across the alveolus. So A would have to be the carbon dioxide going out and B would be the oxygen gas going in. So remember when we breathe in, we're taking in oxygen. When we breathe out, we're releasing carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere. All right, let's move on to the next topic, the circulatory system, and we'll be labeling the heart, the main organ of the circulatory system. So let's go. So A is pointing at the vena cava, the largest vein in the body, carries deoxygenated blood towards the right side of the heart. B is pointing at the right atrium. So that is the upper chamber on the right. C is pointing at the right ventricle. So we see that here. D is pointing at the aorta, the largest artery in the body, and this is responsible for carrying oxygenated blood throughout the entire body. E is the pulmonary artery, as you can see, is connected to the right side of the heart. So always remember arteries take blood away from the heart, veins take blood towards the heart. So the vena cava is a vein, and then F is another vein, the pulmonary vein, which will be carrying oxygen-rich blood from the lungs to the left side of the heart. G is the left atrium, and H is the left ventricle. So you should also know about the valves between the atria and the ventricles, particularly. So we have the bicuspid valve on the left side, between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And then we have the tricuspid valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle. 
and then between the ventricles and the arteries you have the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve. So remember the purpose of valves is to prevent back flow. All right, so staying with the topic of circulatory system, let's look at these blood vessels. So you, you should be able to identify the difference between an artery, a vein, and a capillary. So in this diagram, the capillary is the one labeled already, and it's the smallest of the blood vessels. So you really should know the difference between an artery and a vein. You should be able to identify it based on just looking at it. So blood vessel A is actually pointing at the artery. Blood vessel B is the vein. So generally, veins have the valves, so that is one of the key differences between the artery and the vein. Only the veins have valves which prevent back flow. Vein has thin muscular walls, and the lumen of the vein, which is the opening, which the blood will be flowing through, is usually much larger than the artery. And the blood going through the vein is flowing under very low pressure, so it's usually moving pretty slow. So that is why valves are important to prevent that back flow. Now on the other hand, the artery has a much smaller lumen. It has thicker walls to withstand the high pressured flowing blood that's going through it. So that is why there's no need to have valves. Valves to stop back flow. But the artery doesn't need valves because it's unlikely for high pressured, fast flowing blood to flow backwards. So it's more likely to go in one direction only. So therefore arteries do not need valves. So that's just a summary of the differences between the artery and the vein. Now in terms of the capillary, which is the smallest blood vessel, as you can see here, this is a capillary network forming. Capillaries are known for the exchange of materials, um, uh, tissues. So this is where you're going to have the nutrients and the oxygen being delivered to the cells of the tissues and then any waste materials would be returned to the blood. So that is the purpose of capillaries for the exchange of materials. Alright, let's move on to look at the blood. So we have four components of the blood highlighted here. So you should be able to recognize these components based on their appearance. So A is pointing at the red blood cells. So the red blood cells, they don't have any nucleus. They carry hemoglobin, which is the red pigment, hence why they're called red blood cells. So they're usually these biconcave shaped discs. So these biconcave cells flattened in the middle and a little thicker around the ends. So those are the red blood cells responsible for transporting oxygen around the body. B is the platelets. So the platelets are known for blood clotting. So they're just small fragments of cells. So there's nothing special about them. They don't have any nucleus either. Now down here, C is pointing at the lymphocyte. So C and D are two forms of white blood cells. So C is the lymphocyte. And D is the phagocyte. So how can you tell the difference? Well, the lymphocyte usually has a much larger, more rounded shaped nucleus. And it tends to take up a lot of space in the cell. And the phagocyte, the shape of the nucleus is a little irregular lobe shape. So remember the phagocyte is the one responsible for engulfing pathogens while lymphocytes are responsible for producing antibodies. Alright, let's move on to plant transport. So this is for those studying CSET biology only. So the vascular tissue in plants, so this is all related to the transport of different materials within the plant. So A is actually the xylem vessels. So xylem vessels transport water and minerals upwards from the roots up to the leaves of the plant. And B, 
would be that tissue between the xylem and the phloem, which is C. So the cambium is basically a group of rapidly dividing cells that would give rise to either the xylem or the phloem. The phloem is responsible for transporting organic solutions, so mostly sugars, and it tends to go downwards from where the plant would have made the sugars in the leaf. So hence where you have the arrows pointing down in the phloem and the arrows pointing upwards in the xylem. So remember, water needs to go up from roots to leaves. In the phloem, you need to have the sugar being transported to different parts of the plant from the leaves downwards to all the different parts, the stem, the roots, all those different parts. So that's why the arrows are pointing downwards. All right, let's move on to the topic of excretion. And we have the urinary system shown here. So A is the kidney, the main organ of the urinary system. And there are two kidneys. And B is the ureter. So once again, you have a ureter coming from each kidney. And this is what will be carrying the urine. So the kidney is responsible for making the urine. The ureter is the tube that would transport the urine from the kidney to C, which is the bladder. So the bladder stores the kidney for a period of time until it is ready to be released. And D is the urethra. So you don't want to get mixed up between ureter and urethra. So ureter connects the kidney to the bladder urethra connects the bladder to the outside world. So this is where the urine will be coming out into the toilet. All right, so moving on, still on the topic of excretion. So we're gonna focus more on the structure of the kidney. So we have some blood vessels leading to the kidney and you need to know the difference. So one is the renal artery So this is going to be taking the blood that needs to be purified and cleaned up towards the kidney. And two is the renal vein, which would carry the purified blood away from the kidney. Three is pointing at the pelvis. So at, the, at this point in the kidney, this is where all the urine would be drained out towards the ureter. So remember the ureter connects the kidney to the bladder. All right, let's go over to five. Five is the inner medulla, or you can just title it medulla. Six is the nephron, the functional unit of the kidney. And seven is the cortex, the outer cortex. So the key part of this kidney that you need to know about is the nephron, and that's what we're going to look at now. So you need to know these parts of the nephron. The nephron is the functional unit of the kidney, which is responsible for actually making the urine. And there are thousands of these nephrons within the kidney tissue. So A is the Bowman's capsule. B is the glomerulus. So the glomerulus is a knot of capillaries where the filtration will be occurring. So the process of ultrafiltration occurs in the glomerulus to filter out the small substances that can pass through into the Bowman's capsule. So the Bowman's capsule is acting as a cup to collect the filtrate from the glomerulus. C is the proximal tubule. So that filtrate in the Bowman's capsule would just contain small substances that were able to pass through from the glomerulus. Large substances like proteins and blood cells cannot pass through. So your filtrate would only contain water, salts, um, urea, glucose. So anything that's small enough to pass through would pass through to the proximal tubule. So it's in the proximal tubule where you're going to have selective reabsorption occurring. So only useful substances that need to go back into the blood would be reabsorbed back into the blood. 
So from here on, you're just going to have mostly water, some salts, and urea continuing along the nephron. So D is the loop of Henle. Where the water regulation would occur. E is the distal tubule. And the final part of the nephron will be the collecting duct. So at this stage, all the water would have been adjusted, the salts would have been adjusted, and the urine is now fully formed and ready to leave the nephron and then exit the kidney into the ureter. So these are the key parts of the nephron that you need to know how to label. So that is it for this video. So please stay tuned for the next video in which I will look at 15 more diagrams that you need to know for your biology exams. And be sure to like and share this video if you know it can be helpful to someone who is studying for their exams. And thanks for watching.